Hi, everyone, and welcome to another Sunday Roast, back with two wonderful guests that have been with us before. Uh, we'll start with Helena. Can you tell us a bit about yourself for anyone who's new to the show? Hi there. So I'm Helena. I run the channel No Justice MCG. We talk about politics live streamed every single day. I think usually six days a week, either afternoons or evenings from a, a leftist perspective. Um, you can follow me if you want to at No Justice MTG on all of the platforms, YouTube, Twitter, TikTok, Instagram, Facebook, all of that. And I'm looking forward to this discussion. Happy to be here. Fantastic. Great to have you. Phil, can you tell us a bit about yourself? Running yeah, you? I'm uh, Phil. I'm mostly on YouTube on the, a different bias channel. I discuss British politics mostly with a particular focus on Westminster politics and, you know, Brexit as well as my main sideline. Fantastic. My wonderful co-host, Alex, can you tell us a bit about yourself for anyone who's new to the podcast and the show? Hi, I'm Alex, also known as Political X. I'm a YouTuber, historian, journalist, and I've got a few fingers and a few other pies. Max, my wonderful co-host, can you introduce yourself, please? My name is Max. I run the Robespierre channel where I talk about British politics and Brexit in particular. We're, we have two wonderful guests and we're going to start on the issue of Labour, the Labour Party. Alex, do you want to introduce us to that? Yeah. So we thought we'd go through a little bit of a different format. We keep getting told that we're a bit of an echo chamber, fair enough. But we thought we'd go with a little bit of a different stance for this week. And we've got two people with differing views on Labour and what's going to happen in the next general election. And we'd love for you guys to give your opinions on the Labour Party and who they are right now. Helena, would you like to kick us off and tell us about your perspective on Labour, your critique on Labour and everything else? And in part, I'll add this, in part, this is down to the fact that Owen Jones came out recently and brought into discussion how he'd left the Labour Party and we felt this is a, actually an interesting topic to discuss. Um, Helena? Absolutely. Well, thank you very much. Yeah, absolutely. So I have left the Labour Party as well, just like Owen Jones had, although I, I was about yeah, two years ago at this point it was quite a while back that I had originally left I joined the Green Party very very recently uh, basically in terms of the direction the party is going in terms of policy in terms of rhetoric in terms of ideology and this is not something that fits with my personal level of politics now of course I do have I'm happy to have alliances of convenience with people when I believe that we have mutually concordant goals but overall I feel like that the Labour Party's policy perspectives has diverged so far from the kind of things I want to see from an incoming government that I cannot fully in good conscience support it especially in the situation that we are currently in where Labour essentially guarantees to win the next election and there's a lot of discussion about oh what about a 1992 moment and I really do not think that, that is something that we're going to be seeing on the cards at any point given the gigantic level of the lead the hatred of the Conservative Party the way the polls have been so static for so long and the rise of Reform UK means I do not believe that there is any risk of a vote split for example by voting for somebody who challenged the Labour Party to the left from a social socialist perspective is ever going to lead to anything that would lead to the Conservative Party at getting into power. The Labour Party will be given a gigantic mandate if the current results stay as they are, and they need to be challenged robustly, not just from outside the party in terms of discussion on the internet within journalism within the media, but also in terms of who is being a representative in Westminster. The kind of electoral maths that is relevant for the Labour Party that they know that they cannot rely on the left wing's vote without consequence and to just ditch all of what they would believe to be per certain parts of left wing policy. Now, again, I'm not somebody who believes that they have to conform to every single part of what I personally want to see happen. I have loads of different wishes I want to see from policy, but there's not that I mean that everything has to be there for me to want to support them. But there comes a point where they diverge so far on red line issues that they have to be challenged. They have to be given certain levels of which the electoral support is not given entirely without uh, any kind of uh, any kind of metric that would preclude that. So the main key areas that I have are red lines. First of all is in terms of healthcare policy, in terms of what is discussion around extra use of private sector in the NHS, which I fundamentally disagree with the entire Labour Party position on this particular issue. The workforce plan is fine, but broadly in terms of when we are looking at plans in terms of extra capital investment, in terms of extra financial investment in the healthcare service, given the current state of their macroeconomic policy on the fiscal rules, they cannot guarantee them having any additional funding for day-to-day -day spending if they do not raise taxes on the rich, which is another area of red line for me personally, which is that wealth inequality is the biggest problem in our society and they have categorically ruled out which Rachel Reeves has said multiple times any wealth taxes any cap increase in capital gains taxes any increases in dividends taxation any they've junked their policy on there being a financial transactions tax there's all these different parts of their policy perspectives that do not face the fundamental challenge of our society today on top of all of these things there are plenty of other policy areas I disagree with in terms of I would 
much I would only support a party if they had an ethical foreign policy and the actions of the Labour Party and the Labour leadership over the conflict in in Palestine has been nothing short of abominable and I cannot support that up until this point and lastly the last thing that has made me completely disaffected with the Labour Party is the internal party politics the removal of the Labour Party's mem the Labour membership and the union's role in, in dictating policy subcontracting this out to groups like Labour Together and the Tony Blair Institute and places like that where where for example, the unions have had to walk out of national policy forum meetings over issues where they couldn't move the Labour leadership on. This is something that I cannot countenance in terms of my own personal interaction with a party. It has to be democratic, it has to be pulled into its own membership rather than allowed to be subcontracted out to other people, to the point at which their biggest pledge that I was a big fan of was the Green Prosperity Plan, the £28 billion investment per year. Not that the figure is the relevant part of it, but there needs to be large scale investment, which now does not exist anymore. And we're only in this position because Morgan McSweeney and Pat McFadden at the top of the party can decide unilaterally they're going to junk a policy, junk a commitment that they've made during the entirety of the years up to that point without even cons consultation within party membership or on the National Policy Forum. Whereas my own party of choice, which is the Green Party, they are offering this. They have supported a ceasefire in Gaza from day one. They do support taxes on the rich. They do support things like building council houses using state funding, which has been ruled out also by Rachel Reeves. And they want to end private involvement in the NHS and nationalize our water industry. There are plenty of things that I perceive to be fundamental challenges to the structure of our economy and the structure of our society that Labour are not willing to take measures to challenge. And whilst I can guarantee, as we have discussed before, that Labour are nailed on to win the election. These things have to be challenged, otherwise they will have a mandate to continue the sclerotic politics and economic politics of the last 14 years. And that can only be done externally from the party because all internal party democracy has essentially been usurped by the people at the top. Uh, thanks for that. Um, so I'd like to bring in Phil. Now, Phil, I, I don't know if you'd like to respond to some of the points there, because I, then I think it'd be good to move on to what you predict will happen with the Labour Party in power from both of you. But um, Phil, would you like to give an introduction or would you like to respond to some of those points? I'll just, I'll give an introduction. I can respond to some of the points. What I would just say is some of the things that Helena has said about the way the Labour Party operates are not actually true. Um, for example, Labour have also supported a ceasefire and where people uh, go wrong with that is they say, oh, but they didn't use the word ceasefire. They wouldn't use the word ceasefire. And it's like, no, they didn't. And maybe they should have done, but there was a, a fear that they didn't want to be associated with the people who were using the term ceasefire to mean Israel shouldn't use weapons, but Hamas was still fine to. Um, but nonetheless, the practical application of what they were saying before the siege of Gaza even began was the same as a ceasefire. They were saying civilians shouldn't be fired on. They were talking about, they used the term humanitarian pause, but it amounts to the same thing. What is a ceasefire other than stop firing on civilians so that we can get aid to civilians and make sure that they are not being endangered. That was their policy before Israel fired a shot. Uh, it's also, you know, so, Helena didn't say this to be fair, but there are some who will say things like, oh, you know, they, you know, Keir Starmer said it was fine to cut off water electricity. Like, no, he didn't. He gave a clumsy interview where he said quite clearly that um, international law should be upheld. But what he also said, again, long before Israel did anything to break any international law was he said and his exact words were we call on all parties to act in line with international law including allowing humanitarian access of food water electricity and medicines to Gaza ensuring humanitarian corridors in Gaza for those fleeing violence uh, so again it's like they don't they didn't use the exact words but the practical application of the policy was the same Similarly, with some other policies with Labour, um, I mean, you know, obviously, Helene needs to be able to come back with some of these as well, so I don't want to go through every one. But some of the, the, the ways Helena talked about is the, the structure of the Labour Party, how it forms policy. It's exactly the same system as before with previous leaders, um, including Jeremy Corbyn, Ed Miliband, Gordon Brown, Tony Blair, John Smith, even. It's, the, it's basically the same system. And where some people who don't agree with a particular system you mentioned some members of unions delegates from unions walking out it's because they weren't getting their own way we saw the same thing in the 1980s with that famous conference and you know but it, it is the same thing ultimately what it is is there were some people who had policies that they approved of and they liked and they were adopted by the labor leadership and they liked that and now they don't like it and they don't like the fact 
that all of a sudden they don't have the authoritarian power to determine otherwise. But the reality is that there is no such thing as a good policy if you lose the election because you don't get to implement it. You know, Labour have not implemented a single policy for well over a decade now, well over a decade. Um, and that's the reality. So where I come from, from a Labour point of view. So my personal view, were I to work my will, were I to be, I don't, I, I keep saying I should never be a dictator for life, but were I to be a dictator for life, the policies I would apply are very, very, very different to the ones I support the Labour Party. And that is because I am not a typical voter. I am very far, you know, the things that I think would be best are very far removed from most voters. So my manifesto of the things that I think would be best for the country are unelectable. So what I do is I say, okay, so realistically, what can I do to achieve any good at all? So I need to work with people who swing elections. Who are the people who decide what poli what organization, political party in this case, gets to implement policy? Well, it's people around the center of politics. So I congregate, and happily in this country, most the median is slightly center left. So that's handy because it means, you know, you've straight away got people who are more in favor of say nationalization than privatization. But where I come from in terms of my support specifically for labor is because every time a general election has been announced in my lifetime, ever since, and I've been interested in politics from a young age, but I've been, you know, much more keenly aware of the impacts of politics from say my late teens. And in every election where the announcement has been made about who's won and the announcement is that it's going to be a conservative government. My instant thought has been, so instead of people being raised out of poverty, more people are going to be plunged into poverty. Instead of people having a better quality of life, they're going to have a worse quality of life. Some people are going to have their life ended before their time. And every time Labour have won an election, I know the reverse is going to be true. And, you know, the last Labour government, which is the only Labour government I've lived through, technically I was born into a Labour government, but I, I didn't really know what was going on when I was one. But <laughs> in terms of the last Labour government, um, there were lots of things where I didn't feel they went far enough. And I was young and a bit more idealistic then as well. There were some things that are objectively were bad policies, of course. And, you know, hindsight's borne that out as well. But, but people improved their standard of living. Their standard of living went up. Uh, people's incomes went up in real terms. People's access to healthcare improved in real terms. As someone who started my teaching career at the start of the Labour government, I saw funding coming flooding in all of a sudden. But again, this is where you do need to keep a careful eye on them. Some of that funding wasn't always well spent. You couldn't criticise the money coming in. But for example, as a teacher, I started off you know, with, with chalkboards and then whiteboards then it was interactive whiteboards almost mm. nobody uses it. The, the first ones were rubbish anyway and almost nobody used them they're just glorified projection screens alex is nodding along there uh, i have seen a small number of teachers who've used them well almost nobody uses them at all they're basically pants and um and that was a lot of money that could have been spent better so it's one of those things like the the, the priorities were right uh, in fact, I discussed this with, um, you know, John Bosco Nog Nogbo of uh, We Own It. So I did a video on it, but before that we had a discussion, I didn't record this discussion. And he was making a really good point that, so when Labour come in, they will have really good intentions for the NHS, but they will not make all the right decisions. And one of the failures in the system is what will happen is Labour need to improve things in the NHS really quickly. They're totally committed to that. It would be ridiculous to suggest any Labour MP isn't totally committed to that. But will they hear about an idea that could be really great and it sounds amazing and they go with it and it turns out to not be a great idea? That is the worry that they they listen to some technological solution that someone can apply then offer and it always sounds brilliant and the hype sounds amazing and and they go yeah let's do that and then it turns out actually it doesn't work very well um you know we could point for example to the, to the horizon system for the post office you know some some systems don't work i mean i remember as a teacher 
the last time I worked full time, they were introducing a new information system, computer database. And what nobody did who was designing this for us, or you know, it wasn't designed from scratch, of course, we're just one college, but you know, putting together a kit. No one went around the teacher saying, what do you use the current system for? What do you find works? And what do you wish worked better? Because what we did, we had two systems that didn't really link together. Um, so we're going to have this all encompassing system. Sounded brilliant, but no one came around asking the people who were going to be using it. That's really, that's, I, Helene, I'm going to bring you back in. Um, that's really interesting because the FA, the Football Association, did the exact opposite. They totally knuckled down, listened to both experts and the membership because you can be a member of the FA and you are automatically a member if you become a coach. You, you have to, you can't coach without that membership. Mm -hmm. So that's really interesting, actually. I've never, never thought of that, but the FA did more to listen to its members and improve. I mean, we're literally, we've now gone from a team that could never win and we're getting to finals. I mean, if, if you want a simple metric for success, I'm not saying that's the be all and end all, but that's really interesting. I've never thought of that. Oh. Helena, I know you want to uh, bring you in. I think the I think the broader point really that was raised here is this idea is generally when it comes to policy, when it comes to choosing policy, I guess we'll stick with kind of domestic policy more broadly, is this idea okay. that and I think that you know this it's plenty it's absolutely true that you can only implement policy if you win an election. The place that I would disagree here is the idea that the kind of policy that we want to see is somehow unelectable. Now, of course, I got I am absolutely willing to concede that. There were, the Labour lost the elections in 2017, 2019 and in 2015 on broad levels of where they sat on the political spectrum in terms of policy. So you can't just take, say, the 2017 manifesto, which was the best performing manifesto of those threes, reprint it, rerun it and then expect to win an election. I'm not saying that we have to entirely just rerun in terms of policy what Labour were promising in 2017, for example. I'm not saying that. But what I do take as issue with is that all of these changes in position that Labour have taken since Kistama has become leader, since we've the, the kind of massively shifted in terms of policy platform is necessary to be done to win the election, because essentially what Labour are running on is the fact that the Tories are despised at this point. Not just that, not just the Tories being despised, but also Reform UK are eating chunks out of the Conservative vote. So that they, the free run they've got towards getting its government, they have plenty of leeway to apply more policy that has lots of broad support that people might otherwise be wary about. Obviously, we know from the kind of polling that you see, people broadly in this country, even within the centre swing voters, are on board with nationalising our water sector. They're on board with nationalising our mail, uh, mail. Obviously, rail and bus services probably will get nationalised under the Labour government, but the the water industry is really the big one at the moment, as we've seen the absolute outrage over the kind of things like sewage dumping in our rivers. And That's exactly right. And we just set out the full picture of what the Environment Agency has uh, recorded today. It is uh, sewage outflows uh, into rivers and waterways uh, that happen most often when there's heavy rainfall. Uh, it's, a, it's a safety valve, if you like, although there's nothing safe about what's coming out of these pipes uh, to prevent uh, water backing up into people's homes. Uh, a doubling of the number of hours that sewage outflows have been pouring into waterways to 3.6 million hours. That's up from uh, 1.75 million in 2022 and more than 470,000 incidents across last year. When it comes to taxes on like the super rich, not just increased income taxes, we don't think, I don't think we should be increasing income taxes. When it comes to wealth taxation, people broadly in support of that too, likewise with capital gains taxes. And when it comes to the most important areas of policy that I personally believe are red lines for where I want to put my vote, I don't think these are things that Labour could adopt and lose so many votes that they would essentially be gifting the election to the Conservative Party. Because again, Ed Miliband tried that in 2015. It didn't win him the election. So the, this idea that we naturally have to give up all of the kind of policy that we want to see to get elected, I don't think I would agree with that more broadly. And the second point I would come down to is this idea that we're getting a Labour government into power, into office, would therefore 
I mean, of course, there are plenty of good things that happened under the Blair administration. I would absolutely agree with that. But what was the long term damage that was done by undermining a lot of principles that the Labour Party should stand for that are then reneged on under the Blair administration? You know, bungs for landlords by having buy to let mortgages expanded, PFI contracts essentially laden in huge amounts of the public sector with toxic debt that they can't get rid of to justify the austerity policy of the Cameron administration, the ignoring what the electorate desire in terms of immigration policy harboring a future in which people support that we saw a rise in support of the British National Party. On top of that, we saw the continuation of Thatcherite deregulation of the financial sector that led to the financial crisis of 2008 that essentially became a single stick used to beat the entirety of left-wing politics, despite the fact that it was explicitly a right-wing policy that caused that failure. A failure which it looks like Labour wants to get row back on again, since Rachel Reeves is happy to support Jeremy Hunt's Edinburgh reforms, including up to 60% reductions in liquidity requirements on private insurers in the wake of coming climate catastrophes and potential future pandemics. Like This is policy that I think that broadly, even if Labour get into power, what they do is they don't get enough of the kind of things that would fundamentally change society for the better. And they fundamentally push the lever back so that in five years time, when this potential decade of national rule that they tout that they want to do won't materialise because of the poor policy they've hanged on themselves with. And all we'll end up doing is seeing the Overton window and the policy and economic position of our country being pushed even further rightwards as time goes on. Can I, can I, can I just clarify on something? When you were talking about the 2008 crash and the deregulation, was that in reference to UK policy or US policy that or you were UK referring policy. to? UK, UK policy. policy. I mean, My understanding have, would be... Yeah. My understanding has always been that it's been US, it was the US yeah. that caused this. They, they, it was US deregulation, which is why I wanted clarification that caused this, because they basically <laughs> gave out mortgages to anyone at a ridiculous scale, and it was just unsustainable, and that caused the economic crash. And it was just interesting because I felt, and this is something else we can bring in as well, that the media in the UK was so powerful at that point, and internet, social media wasn't pushing back in, in political stance, that the blame got put onto a Labour government in the UK for a US deregulation problem. Yeah, we I'll also deregulate just... our financial sector as well, though. Okay, yeah, I know, I know. Can I just I'm, ask I'm Helena not, a question? Can I on, just Phil. ask Helena a question? Because actually the UK government increased regulation. So can you tell me an example of regulation that they relaxed? Well, they didn't relax. One thing, they didn't relax any regulation person. What I'm saying is they continued. They but continued with the kind of level of deregulation that we had under Margaret Thatcher. But, but but that, hang on. If you continue I mean, with deregulation, my, my, verbi yeah. my verbiage was 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 muddled there. I so hang on, was, sorry. Was... All right, let me see. If I so what you're saying is some regulations that that were. So you're saying they didn't reduce regulation; they just didn't increase it enough. That's correct. Yeah, we okay, I'd agree with like... that. They they did yeah. actually increase regulation. They did, and actually that did save us a little bit. But I would 100 percent agree that it was not enough, and and that that they were told that it would not be enough. I mean, part, I mean, part of Giddens prospectus for the third way was that this only works if you regulate the financial sector and they didn't do it enough like proper re prudential regulation and capital controls and in small amounts yeah, yeah. could have helped us protect ourselves yeah, Australia is the perfect model of I, this I 100% I agree with that can we can we bring in Phil once again and to respond to some other other points yeah, but so also we'll... but also to move on to maybe what what would you like to see in the next in the first 100 days of a Labour government and by the end of a term so we'll come back to Helena after that. Yeah, I mean, so Helena, you did go through a few things there and I may have forgotten some of the things. So if I try and pick out a couple and then if I forgot to address something you said, just bring it back. Um, so when you said, so one of your points you're making, you've made it twice now, uh, which is a fair enough point, is um, you're basically saying, as I understand it, please correct if I'm wrong, that the Labour government, you, you can't support it because certain red lines, okay. Um, but it will be better than the Conservative government and by encouraging people who might have voted Labour to vote for someone else, say the Green Party that you're now a member of, you're saying you're not going to risk that government. Anyway, we're not going to have a Conservative government and therefore you want um, more people to vote for someone else as a sort of um, protest, as, as a way of saying not everyone agrees that we want a Labour government. 
or, or that not everyone yeah. agrees with this form of Labour government. So but what I, I would say... Worth, worth, before you... Go on. Can you just yeah, to clarify sure. that point yeah, there? Yeah, yeah, sure. I, rather than, I think it's worth clarifying specifically that a lot of people will look at these kind of voting patterns and say, well, you're trying to vote with your conscience, for example. And I think I would want to kind of push back on these kind of claims. I don't know if that you're necessarily making that slight. No, no, no. I think I was... there is... A, I, yeah, I, I just want to make sure yes. clear for the listeners. I think there is a broad utility in in the Labour Party understanding that they cannot take voters for granted and on top of that more green MPs in Parliament can be voices for progressive policy that Labour have reneged on. Sure yeah uh, I can absolutely see that and and, and in fact uh, this will inevitably get onto this one um, when we're talking about what I'm most looking from a Labour government is actually electoral reform so that people don't have to vote tactically at all that in fact if you have a representative election system then the way people vote is genuinely representative of what they want. Because, let I mean, I'm clear, there will be millions of people who vote Labour in this election who are voting Labour because it's preferable rather than exactly what they want or even broadly what they want, OK? But what I would say is this, this idea of yours that if, if a group of people are going to vote... For, like So just being clear for people who may not know how the thing breaks down. So in this country... There's like a couple of seats where Labour are challenging the Greens. There's a seat where Labour are challenging the Lib Dems. There's a few dozen seats where Labour are challenging the SNP. But for the vast majority of seats, it's a Labour candidate or a Conservative candidate. Um, so, and, and, and that is the situation for the vast majority of people. If they choose to vote for someone that's not the Labour candidate in one of, I mean, there are seats, of course, where it's between, say, the Lib Dems and the Conservatives, SNP and the Conservatives, Plaid and the Conservatives. But for the hundreds and hundreds of seats, the clear majority of seats, it's between Labour and the Conservatives. So anyone that is um, anti-Tory but votes for someone that's not the Labour candidate, which obviously is their decision, um, they are making the election of a Conservative candidate more likely. So what you are saying is it's, it cannot actually jeopardise the result, which I agree with. But then what you're also saying is the reason it cannot jeopardise the result is because the number of people who will um, agree with you on this point are so small in number that it can't jeopardise the result. Do you see what I mean? I think what I would say, the, 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 I think the crux of my point here is that I think there is broader, for those who want a progressive policy, there is more utility in making Labour have to at least somewhat try and court your mm. vote in future. Of course, even if they win this election, they know that they're not looking for five yeah. years in government. They're looking for 10, they're looking for 15. They have to know where their base of support is going to be sure. in five years time to maintain that come the next election. I think that broad utility is greater than the utility of the Tories having, you know, 50 MPs instead of 100. So shall I shall I give you my counter view to that then? So sure. the... The reason why the Labour do have some bad policies, they have those bad policies because that is what voters broadly agree with. And the reason why they have ad adopted those policies, because there are some policies that Labour and the Conservatives will have that may not have broad agreement, but they know they can get away with. And they're good policies from their point of view. The reason why Labour have adopted some policies that, that they themselves are doing, well, you know, we have to do this to win votes is because they're countering the Conservatives, because the Conservatives are the alternative. But this election is quite unique, completely unique. It's, it's better even than 1906. The 1906 election marked a significant political shift in Britain as the Liberal Party, led by Henry Campbell Bannerman, secured a landslide victory over the Conservative Party. The Conservatives as the latest polling shows, have no safe seats. The closest they have to safe seats are ones where they have a decent lead, say about 12 to 15%, uh, and they none of them have more than that anyway, and where the tactical vote isn't clear. That is the closest they have to a, a safe seat. So they could credibly be beaten down to, say, 30 seats if people vote tactically against the Conservatives. Now, what that would mean is it would mean a lot of Labour MPs, but it would also mean that the Conservatives would not be the official opposition. The Liberal Democrats would be the official opposition. And in a lot of seats, if vote, there, there's a lot of voters who certainly don't like the far right tilt of the Conservatives, but they still see it as preferable to Labour, so they hold their nose and vote Conservative. And the reason why many of them don't vote Liberal Democrat 
is because they think but the dem the liberal democrats okay they can represent me in parliament but they can't change anything they can't form a government but if the liberal democrats are then seen as the official party of opposition and people think hang on a minute the liberal democrats are actually as likely or more likely to win power than the conservatives because the conservatives have got like half the number of seats you create a situation maybe i mean there's lots of ifs to this but you create a situation where maybe um, the Liberal Democrats become the alternative, and then Labour are no longer having to counter Conservative policies, but Lib Dem policies, which are much more moderate, right? And But then the flip side of that, which is your idea, is you're going to deprive Labour of these votes, okay? And Labour are going to win anyway, that's your argument. When Labour look to the next election, they're not going to look to win over the votes of people who wouldn't even vote for them after 14 years of the Tories destroying everything because those votes are on the same. It's like, if you can't win them this year, bloody hell, you're never going to win them uh, when, the, when the Tories are no longer the main threat. They're going to concentrate on retaining the appeal to the people who did propel them to power. So your argument, and I'm not saying it's definitively wrong, but your argument is you have a more powerful voice if you, if you um, back a smaller party which in like two seats could return a green MP, sure. Um, and I know they're targeting four, but realistically two. But in, for the vast majority of seats, you're asking them to vote for someone who has no chance. And it might actually result in them ending up with a conservative MP who's certainly not going to represent them. And Labour aren't going to chase after those votes because they're unwinnable. If they can't win them this year, when Labour may, we don't know, there's lots of ifs and buts, but they may get their best result ever in history why would they chase after the, the votes they couldn't even get in this year? That would be my point. I think the first thing I would say in response to that is I don't think that the people that they're going to be winning over this time are necessarily being won over and sticking to Labour necessarily because of any part of their policy perspectives. It's it's their it's their consternation with the Conservative governance. And on top of that, it's just generalised material conditions. Their, you know, the lack of personal levels of prosperity, stagnant wages, all of these kind of things, the, the cost of living crisis and the general malaise in terms of the entire structure of the country and everything that we've seen. And the, the problem I have is that I actually don't think that they can necessarily hold on to those votes unless they fix those problems. And when I look at the policy perspectives, I don't think they're going to fix them. That's the big problem that I have. And second of all, I would say that you know, the fact that I think most people like myself who are voting for the Green Party are doing so because of policies that Labour have abandoned. I think it should be a clear signal to Labour that we are winnable votes. It's not our, our votes are based upon what policy they offer and not indeed whether or not they are wearing a red rosette or a blue rosette. OK, I mean, I can guarantee that is not the case. Labour will not see the votes they couldn't win this year as winnable in the next election. It, it's not how uh, polling uh, electoral strategy Can I, can I inter well, just interrupt on, for a second? Can I just interrupt for a second? Is, mm. is there a possibility of seeing uh, a UKIP off the left? That's a question I'd pose to both of you. No, not at all. Uh, UKIP basically were the political wing of the media barons. Ultimately, you need a huge, I mean, if I actually, so I did, I forgot to address another of Helena's points, which she's just made again now, which just reminded me of this idea that it's not Labour's policy platform that's appealing to voters. It's just the fact they hate the Tories. We know for a fact that's not true because it's a hypothesis, but we proved that it wasn't true in 2019 because in 2019, in the summer of 2019, the Conservatives went down to polling levels that they now have. Um, the Brexit party was polling twice as well as Reform UK are now, and Labour were not the beneficiaries. In fact, Labour sunk both lower than both of them. So we know that it is not automatically the case that if the Conservatives are as popular as a fart in a broken lift, that Labour benefit. That's not the case at all. We know that's not the case because of polling from 2019. We know what is the case. It is the policies, and they are adopting these policies in order to win over those votes. Labour are being incredibly efficient with their vote, winning over people. That is why the polls are as they are. It is because they have focused on the voters they need to win instead of retreating back to their core. Because anyone who's a member of the Labour, I mean, you've left the Labour Party, so you're honest enough to say, I no longer want to support this and that's great. But anyone who is a member of the Labour Party, because you've talked about, you know, you should listen to the members. Anyone who's a member of the Labour Party is they're a member of the Labour Party for one of two reasons. 
Either first, they believe in the project so much that they want to give the party a bit of extra money to help it happen and want to go and canvas and knock on doors and support the party. It's not because they want power. It's because they want to get Labour into power. The other type of member of any political party, we've seen this especially in the Conservative Party, are entryists who do want to steer policy in a particular way that is against the wishes of the people. We've seen that with the UKIPification of the Conservative Party, which is now almost complete to the point where you've got Nick Fletcher, today as we're recording this, but a few days ago from when it's going out, actively supporting Reform UK, calling for people to vote for Reform UK in a particular constituency when he and he still has the Conservative whip and he knows he's going to have the Conservative whip. For me, this has shades of in 2019 when Kate Hoey, as a Labour MP, went out campaigning <laughs> with Nigel Farage for the Brexit party and didn't have the whip removed. You know, it, but, 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 but I mean, this is actually more serious because Nick Fletcher is still the Conservative candidate in this coming election. And yet he's promoting a rival, not just a rival party, but as far as Conservative MPs are considered their main rival party. But again, how did Reform UK suddenly, how did Brexit parties suddenly spring into being? How did Reform UK suddenly spring into being? Massive amounts of money, massive amounts of money from these small number of people who have a vested interest in trying to turn this country into a free market pirate haven. And there is no such money on the left. I guess there's a bigger issue which is of concern. And I get why Helena is saying, look, go left wing if you want left wing we want progressive stuff because a lot of these problems that we have under those policies under labor i don't see them solving it like well, brexit think- is a massive massive issue and well, whatever yeah. and i can i can sort of i can now sort of go when when i had a good dig around at the labor policy i can sort of go this you there's an argument there's two arguments there's an argument that they're stuck between a rock and a hard place and there's an argument that they're just not going hard enough even though they clearly could because they've got the numbers to win and I think there's an element of within those policies, they've gone such a safe route that they could get in and long term, they're going to get out very rapidly, maybe within four, maybe within eight years, because the policies they put forward don't solve the problems that they have. So we've got a mental health crisis. 1.9 million people have got a mental health crisis. You don't solve the NHS. You're not going to fix that. You, the housing policy. I could, I, I've been saying this for about three years now. Get 3D printing out as one solution. Build loads of frigging houses. But we now know, I mean, I haven't seen, I only saw this report briefly. There's a claim that we need, prices say, oh, crisis, <laughs> say that we need about 400,000 houses a year. Labour has said they're going to build 200 to 300,000. And they're going to do it to the private sector. It's not good enough. And it's not going to solve the problems. And we need the housing prices to be solved because we need mortgage prices to go down. And we need rent to go down. The only way you do that is to drop to increase the number of houses to drop the prices but again we're we're in a rock and a hard place situation because you do that you devalue houses and people are going to be pissed off at labor and i just see a number of uh, birth rate 1.56 exact same problem as japan has had japan also had the issue under shinzo abbey 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 economics uh they didn't want immigration i did i ran some calculations we need about 1.2 million people a year because we're losing 600,000 uh because they're leaving the uk and we've got this low birth rate. And in order to replace the birth rate and the 600,000, and again, I go, Labour haven't got a policy to solve that. And I'm going, these are, these are, I'm, I'm going to swear, these are f- huge problems. Epoch and defining, going down, epoch defining problems. And these problems aren't going to be solved under those policies. And because, I'll give them benefit of the doubt here as well. The manifesto is going to be quite important because that's going to be what the Lord's going to use to argue and, fight over with Labour, unless Labour reform the Lords as well. We won't know what they do with this PR and the Lords reform until we see the manifesto. We have an idea because they have said stuff in the media, but I want to see the manifesto. That's where I want to see exactly what they're going to do. And I think that's that's the biggest concern I've got out of all this. And it very much feels like we've got real politic here and we've got ideological politic and both of them have their practical uses and needs and necessity for society. And I end up just going, I can see why they're in a rock and a hard place and they've gone down this a little bit too safe a route. 
there, there's, so there's a couple of points. I think the one thing I want to push back on from Phil's last segment was this idea was the the polls in 2019 going to the Brexit Party. But this was specifically in the run up to the European Parliament elections, where the Brexit Party were campaigning heavily, specifically around the idea of Brexit. I think taking polls with under the auspices of a giant Brexit debate, I, I don't think that that necessarily can be translated into broader Westminster politics. But regardless. When it comes to policy, I think there are plenty of things that we both understand as being important policy where we have the correct position on based on all available evidence, all available data that are unwinnable policies in terms of elections. Immigration being a big one. You can't win elections on being a pro-immigration party anymore. You just can't do it, even though we need the immigration, as you rightly say, dealing with our demographic trends, maintaining our productive capacity to be able to maintain pensions. Because, for example, like a bunch of the, the retired who really want to see immigration drop, they're the ones who are going to lose their triple lock of our productive of capacity drops because of low population but it's, it's unelectable it's completely unelectable to 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 take a pro-immigration stance and so I am happy to watch parties cede ground to the incorrect position on this likewise with a law and order criminal justice policy all of the kind of you know, police crackdown style policy draconian legislation on uh, drugs and things like that we've all seen that these things they don't work in America they don't work in Europe they don't work here but the UK public overwhelmingly support authoritarian uh, criminal justice policy and for example like in the 2017 manifesto labor were just like well you can't trust the, the tories on law and order they cut 10,000 police officers we'll win them back and this is a big policy that won people over from the kind of the swing voted demographic in 2017 to give labor their big boost in polling at the time happy to concede all of these things but it's completely unnecessary as you say given broader support for the policies amongst the public, amongst huge sections of the demographic, apart from very small sections of the more right-wing members of, of the voting demographics. And second of all, in terms of, are they going to actually solve the gigantic problems facing our economy, especially in terms of macroeconomic policy, which I think is one of Labour's worst positions at the moment. These are things that the public supports, we support, and if we don't, if Labour don't do it, they'll be out in five years time. So I would say, so a couple of things there again, before I forget the, the points you made. First of all, in terms of that 2019 thing, no, it was after the European elections. Um, and also, if you're going to say that that is uh, spurious for some reason, you're going to have to give me some polling evidence that a party can adopt unpopular policies and still win, because that doesn't seem sensible. The other thing, uh, just to address there is so i mean well, there's a couple of things first of all you've said that, that the policies you believe in are definitely right they're objectively right i don't ever do that i'm gonna say i don't ever do that i'm sorry that that um that is how ideology is born this belief that you are 100 percent right on everything and that is a reason why you should not compromise with anyone that way the only way that ever first of all it never does anyone any good uh, because that way lies extremism and the only way it ever wins if it's a sort of extremism that's got a lot of public got a lot of money behind it um so i even though there are policies i believe in i i never ever ever say i am 100 percent right on this because there's always something i may not know about and if i don't have that attitude then i won't find allies and i won't ever get what i want and i'll spend my entire life being like bitter and angry um and you know the um Oh, no, I forgot the other point. Sorry. What else? Was, what was there was another point you made? I'm oh, sorry. I've really forgotten. The, the economic policy not will no, not be good enough was... to be able to secure another sorry. government. After... I mean, that's just in terms of like immigration. You, you I mentioned immigration disagree. as well. No, it wasn't yeah. a specific policy. It was a general political okay. point. Sorry, you'll I mean, probably make it. I think it's worth, point, it's worth It's worth saying that I did specifically say when you, when you say, well, if you say that you believe that you're right on something and you won't compromise, I sp specifically said that I would compromise. That I think I know, that but, you but can't, I haven't. Yeah. You've yeah. said that, and because you understand that the need to compromise, but so for, for example, what is a compromise? Give me, can you give me an example of a compromise? How do, in terms of like what kind of in, in terms of something you don't believe is right, but you understand the need for it and you will accept oh, right. the, it. I mean, the, the, I think the main two in terms of policy that the, I think they have to concede on, as I said, were those two things like criminal justice, because we need, I believe in criminal justice reform, but the public don't support it. So we won't get it and we shouldn't get it because it's not a democratic decision the public will make for us. And second of all is, I think we need, can, need to continue immigration. We need absolutely to continue it to maintain productive capacity, but the public will not support it under any circumstances. Yeah. Sorry, I have just remembered what you said. So it was about uh public support for certain policies 
Um, so where a lot of people go wrong, uh, where I think you fall into a trap here is when you say things like people support nationalization. Now, this is true, but with a caveat. What polling shows is that people wish things were nationalized. That is not the same thing as, uh, as supporting nationalization. There's lots of policies that we have polling evidence that a majority agree with. Now, first of all, I will say in a first past the post system, majority public opinion counts for nothing. So if you don't achieve representative electoral reform, uh, holding up a poll that says the majority of people agree with this, no one cares, doesn't matter. So it's, it's politically useless uh, because we have a first past the post system. But also, uh, for example, it comes to nationalization. When you poll people, oh, do you think, like, particularly like you mentioned the water companies before, and that's a really obvious one. And it's like, oh yeah, it should, it, we should never have privatized it. Lots of people can see that that was a stupid idea. It was certainly the wrong idea, even if they don't agree it was stupid. And yet you say to people, okay, so to nationalize it, we'd have to do this, are you in favor of it? They all of a sudden go, no. Uh, classic case in my thing, it's very uncomfortable for me, but it's a fact I have to live with. A lot of pollsters will say, was it wrong to leave the EU? Most people say, yes, it was wrong. Uh, should we be in the EU? Yes, we should be in the EU. But every now and then a pollster will say, do something like, okay, uh, should we rejoin the EU? Majority going, yes, we should. Um, should we rejoin the EU if it means giving up the pound? All of a sudden, majority going, no. And that's, that's, that's the problem with that. That's Just to clarify that that's changed. That number's gone up. So every poll that they've had with changing to the pound to the euro. No, this, I, I'm talking about in the last few. In, yeah, it, oh yeah, the, the trend is that way. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. But what I mean is in the here and now, you can say, you can say, here's a poll that says 60 odd percent of people think that we should rejoin the EU. Oh, should we, we should rejoin the EU. But in the here and now, if you then say to those people, but with these trade offs, should we all of a sudden we don't have that majority. And that is the same with a lot of policies. A lot of people, when you're suggesting something, it's like, if we could wave a magic wand and achieve this, yes. But as soon as you start talking about, and that's why we don't really know a lot of exactly what Labour are going to do, because what they talk about are outcomes. That's what any political yeah. party talks about, because they need about 12 to 14 million people to vote for them. They don't agree on the methods. They are very, very fixed. But lots of people agree on outcomes. Like if you're going to talk about, yeah, we need NHS waiting list back down to like next to nothing like they were in 2010. It's very hard to find someone says, no, we should have massive waiting lists. Um, but, and, and the same thing with any number of policies, they all sound brilliant. So they like the outcomes, but people disagree on the, on the mechanisms. But when you suggest mechanisms to people, all of a sudden the support for the common outcome gets fractured. So this is interesting. I, I, I actually wasn't going to bring it up. I changed my mind and then you brought it back in and that's FDR. And the interesting thing I find with all of this is FDR, uh, Franklin Delano Roosevelt, president of the United States, four times died on his fourth term. Arguably the biggest socialist uh, set of changes implemented in the United States was under him. And it's interesting because the guy obviously had the ability to use propaganda and campaigning and rhetoric and and speeches in order to be able to convince people to change their point of view and like because the republican leader harding i think it was just before him was neoliberal everything he tried to do to fix the economy he couldn't do with his neoliberal policies so it was a big change to have someone sort of coming in an extreme and, and changing that and the reason i bring it in is i don't if starmer had more charisma in front of the camera and someone i think last week actually said to him try and be yourself which weirdly enough is a very uh, I've, I've heard in the wrestling I've, i follow wrestling quite a bit they say the best wrestlers are the ones who are like themselves but on steroids and i get the impression again with starmer if he could sell it he could change and put these policies forward and sure. rishi sunak's got the same problem he's got zero charisma and i'd say starmer's more he's got the, a bit better charisma, the same but he's not a jfk an fdr a barack obama and it's sort of what we're missing in order for him to get those policies over the line. Because the big problem, and it keeps seem to come up in the background, is that the media step in and just basically scupper everything with crazy conspiracy theories or bad ideas that they spread around the public and the public buy. So it's like, as you said, we, uh, this go is, on, Max. Oh, yeah, no, no, I just, but I think it's actually worse than that. Because if you look at 2019, what did what Boris Johnson do 
what were his policies to to win an 80 seat majority it wasn't really anything it was get it was leveling done. up but, it was but, building 40 new hospitals it, it, it was, it was, it was level, very much leveling up and getting brexit done and the getting brexit done wasn't just for brexit support it was for people who didn't want to leave the eu that slogan was out people took it as a pro-brexit slogan it was an anti-brexit slogan to rally them to win because it was like People have been so worn down and people had this attitude that the conservatives were essentially unable. The reason why things were going to hell was not because the conservatives were just breaking the country to bits and money, money, money. Uh, It's because they were, um, oh, they were, it was Brexit. Brexit's distracting them all the time. And Boris Johnson promised we're just going to leave. And then there's nothing to argue about. We've left. It's all fine. We can concentrate on the business of government. And that was a powerful, it motivating was. factor for a lot yeah. of people. Well, what, what well, the big irony. That, yeah, it, it was. It wasn't like a policy in the sense that there was some thinking behind it. That, that there were there was some plan. It was just a slogan. So mm. maybe you maybe you can win elect. Can you win elections just based on so, slogans? Um, so what I was going back to Alex's point is. It would be absolutely fantastic. But this is my argument because we don't have it. It's all right saying, you know, oh, we need a lead. I mean, the leaders you just ran off there, Alex, decades apart, because they're remarkable people who come around, even in a, and they're all Americans you mentioned. Yep. You know, in a huge, you know, five times our population, five or six times our population, and they've come around once every couple of generations. We don't have any. There are no, we don't have any like that in this country. We don't have Ted anyone Heath? in politics. No, in right now, he's dead. No, uh, no, no, fucking yeah. I mean, in his time, he was considered to be quite yeah, good. Yeah, yeah, well, there have yeah. been very charismatic yeah. leaders in this country. Um, you know, Tony Blair was considered very charismatic. It's a bit of a shame, but, you know, <laughs> for his views. Because it, yes. Um, but, um, but we don't have them now. Labour doesn't have them. I and mean, people will say things like, oh, should I like this person or that person? It's like, yeah, they speak to you, but they don't have mass appeal. Labour doesn't have anyone with mass appeal. I, Andy, I think Andy Burnham has mass appeal. No, he doesn't. He absolutely he's the most, he's the, he's, he's the most why didn't politician, he win? politician why in didn't the he UK. Win? Why didn't he win? That's a low bar. Why didn't he win? I mean, it's, I mean, it's oh, as in the, the Labour he couldn't even win. He couldn't even win a popularity contest in his own party. I mean that's because he, he wasn't left wing enough for the party membership. No, that's he, the problem. Yeah, you know, he, if you want he, to take a, if you want to someone with broad appeal, he might not actually be I, that no, appealing I, to the party membership. No, it, it, he's not. He's not got broad appeal to the public. I mean, you say he's no popular. That's because he's doing quite well in Manchester. He's actually doing a good job. Um, you know, and unlike it doesn't have the focus of London, so you don't have the same sort of Tory angst there uh, because they're never going to compete there anyway. Um, which is why, although it was minorly embarrassing that the Conservative candidate for Greater Manchester, the, the fact that the Conservative candidate just a few weeks before the election decided they were going to be the Reform UK candidate, I mean, if that had have happened in London, that would have been devastating for them, but it's just moderately embarrassing. Because, you know, so, you, so Andy Burnham gets a bit of a pass. He is doing a good job, but at the same time, there isn't that political aggro around Manchester as there is in London. What else did he can't? You think he's charismatic? I, he's, um, he's, I mean, he's charismatic, he's, but I think he's, he's he's broadly despised across like anywhere outside of London. Uh, it's a shame. Yeah, I think yeah, he's great. I, we don't have basically what I'm saying is, and this has always been my argument. Like when people say, "Well, well, Labour just need to persuade people of this," it's like, okay, so here's the situation: the mainstream media are basically owned by three people, and um, and they're all billionaires, and only one of them lives in this country, and they they are all with lots of different outlets because people don't realize it's all from three people lots of different outlets all saying the same thing and what you're asking the labor party to do without a charismatic leader but even if they had one it would still be up against it you're asking them to say to the public yeah all these trusted media outlets they're all lying to you we're the ones telling the truth i mean that sounds like crazy town and that is the problem so if we had a really charismatic leader maybe they could swim a bit more upstream but they would still be up against that. And that is why I say the solution to this is electoral reform and the solution and and electoral reform leads to a two dozen other reforms as well, including media reform, which is badly needed. None of this happens without electoral reform. As soon as you have a decent representative system, the Tories are gone, they're finished. They cannot come back to power in their current form because there will never be a majority of people in this country voting for it. 
And at that point as well, it doesn't matter if you have a coalition of very, you could have Labour, Greens and the Lib Dems, they would work much more effectively together than Labour constantly trying to counter the Tories. So you advance things on, and then all of a sudden, if like Labour say we should have media reform, if the, if the media whip up a fuss, which they will do, it's like, but what's the, what's the electoral consequence for Labour? It's not a Conservative government because that will be impossible. What's the electoral consequence for Labour? That maybe the coalition gets a bit bigger for the Lib Dems or something. Well, they'll also be in favour of media reform. So that's why I see that as the path to really solving a great many of our problems. And I know there's an, I mean, I've, I've heard people in the Green Party say the same thing. It's like, yes, but we can't achieve that right now. We've got the climate emergency right now, and blah, blah, blah. It's like, yeah, but you're still standing still. The only prospect we have is electoral reform. And I, you know, electoral reform has a lot of support in Labour, but there is still some opposition. And the best way to sweep the opposition away is with the campaign that says, we're going to vote tactically to crush the Tories and then to have those people write to their candidates, any candidate, quite frankly, that they're going to vote tactically for, but it's going to be most powerful with Labour candidates to email them and say, I'm going to lend you my support because you are the best place to defeat the Conservative candidate here, but I want electoral reform. And then after it to follow up. And, and if you think about this would be very powerful, it could persuade people to do this because imagine like, Sonak's problem at the moment is got a load of Tory MPs who were insistent that to win their seats, they needed tax cuts and they needed to stop the boats and he constantly trying to appease them. And that is because they are powerful to him. You create 200 Labour MPs that are all thinking, right, I won this seat because a load of people voted tactically for me and what they want is electoral reform. And also a lot of those MPs, Labour MPs, are more likely to win their seats under the new system anyway. Because a lot of those Labour MPs will win in what really should be safe Tory seats. And if we keep the system the same as it is, it's going to flip back to being a safe Tory seat in five or ten years' time. I mean, I just think there is zero material incentive for the people who are in charge of the Labour Party right now to support anything that is close to electoral reform. Maybe like rank choice voting at a push, but the kind of like mixed member proportional system that we really do need to have to push the Tories out of any kind of political relevance forever will not come from people who know that as soon as they implement some kind of electoral reform towards a proportional system, they're the half their mem members of their party just completely leave and the party splits in two, which I think is likely to happen given how far out of step with the current Labour membership loads of people at the top of the current Labour party are. I also want to cut, this is quite a while back this point was made, I think I was, I think just want to point up with regards to public support for, for policies in terms of doing things right now rather than just broad, oh, we would like to have these things if they hadn't have happened in the first place. The, in the last MRP poll conducted by Electoral Calculus in February, the most popular policy by 11 points was nationalising utility companies. And amongst Conservative voters, it was the second most popular policy. And that is not just the idea of having them in national ownership. It was the it was the uh, active policy of engaging in nationalisation that was most supported. I mean, it's only one poll. I get it. You know, there are lots of discussions to be had. But the idea that people will not vote for this kind of thing or, or support the actions of engaging it, I think that is something that is up for debate at the very least, regardless. But anyway, I just don't think that even if every single member of parliament in the Labour Party was at the point of saying, well, actually, we would support electoral reform because people have lent us their votes under first past the post. When it comes to people who have the power to make those decisions, given how far they are away from acquiescing to Labour membership or having it as part of their policy perspectives, when they know, well, I've, people will just continue to vote for us proportionally, sorry, uh, tactically under first past the post, it maintains our power over the Labour Party, given that so many people in the Labour Party really just belong in the Liberal Democrats at this point. Like, they're barely social Democrats, if not, you know, just kind of social liberals, really and truly. And they know that their position of having a a level of political power within the Labour Party is entirely contingent on the fact that loads of people have nowhere else to go. And I don't think that unless you unless we just had some kind of radical change in the le levers of power in Labour, which basically doesn't exist anymore now that there is entire control over who gets selected as a parliamentary candidate, wouldn't have been, you know, the Kate Hoey situations that we get were because of the Labour Party meddling and trying to get rid of Mark Osimhoff in the 90s, for example. These kind of things are being done to maintain loyalty to the current leadership with you know, certain you know, reasonable reasons as uh, in, in on top of unreasonable reasons like it's reasonable to want to ensure that you don't have and see the kind of levels to which we have discordant 
party in power where the conservative parties continually fight amongst themselves because they can't agree on anything because people haven't had those kind of selections but what it also means is that the kind of people who get selected are all just a bunch of yes men who just support whatever the kind of political leader of the party wants which currently will never ever be anything other than support for the current political system in terms of electoral reform i mean all i would I... say is oh. while star sorry i've just had to go a couple of months before i forget them again i'm an old man um while Starmer has been in charge, I have been involved in selections of candidates. When Jeremy Corbyn was in charge, we had candidates forced on us. Um, so actually, people do choose. The, the Labour's Labour's input into that is their their vetting. So they're basically saying, "Yeah, you can't have that as a candidate because they're unsuitable." But people are choosing. There will be some candidates that are just basically given to a few people. This is normal, and it will be the ones in seats that are basically unwinnable anyway. Um, and the other thing about, so you mentioned the electoral reform, uh, electoral calculus, sorry, I will just say they're not a pollster, but it's interesting you mentioned a poll there. Uh, can you, just before I go to the other points, can you tell me what the question was? Um, so the, I'm looking at their results page here. It's, uh, the, they have got a broad, I mean, the, the, the table that they have, it says the for policies, the next table shows how many people chose each policy as one of their top three policies. Okay. And 44% of all voters chose to nationalize utility companies in the top three. The next most popular is building more houses at 33% okay. and then sending legal migrants to Rwanda. So, so this poll then doesn't talk about the, the mechanism for nationalizing them. So um, we're into, I... we're into, that's what I mean. Anything that says, do you want this outcome, but doesn't, doesn't give options about the mechanism is a magic wand policy. It's what I call a magic wand policy. It's if we could just make it happen now, if we could just make it happen, would you be in favor? Yeah. Yeah. We know that. We know that people are pro nationalization. They were pro nationalization while they were nationalized. Uh, they're certainly pro nationalization now, but that's not the same thing as saying we want the government to do it. If, it, if there's certain, if it means adding, you know, um, half a trillion pounds to the national debt. Mm. That's the problem. I mean, is I you can get past that though. There's plenty of governments that are nationalized without compensation. There's yeah, nothing. Well, that's that's I mean, what we... I am. That's what I want. That is my preferred system. You need mm. to do it as little cost as possible. You need them to, some of them will fail. And then, um, you know, I, I, I like their attitude with the rail companies is, is obvious. It's like, yeah, as soon as their contracts are up, we're just going to take them over. Uh, with energy, you know, great British energy is going to require some investment. Um, and with water companies, I mean, you know, they're, they're talking at the moment about the hideous amounts of legislation that will be needed. But at the end of the day, Labour's policies for water companies are not realistically going to allow them to carry on their privatised model. It's simply going to be impossible. So either all their water company policies disappear from the manifesto, which, you know, I don't think is the case when people have seen it, or we are going to see them being taken over by the state. Yeah, I just want to ask three, just uh, one point uh, that, that um, I think would be interesting to get both of your takes on. Um, can you name three policies that you think would be implemented at the end of a, of a parliament with Labour in charge? I think the three the three policies that they have said they're going to do, but I absolutely believe that they will do, and I think are good things broadly, are the National Investment Bank, which is, I think it should, I personally want it to have more involvement in cooperative businesses, but it's necessary for growth and they should do it. And I'm glad that they will do it. The local power plan is an excellent policy from Ed Miliband that I almost certainly will implement because it is essentially free for them to do and will guarantee them local election wins for decades to come. And the last one I believe they'll definitely do is the broader devolution settlement like they have been de they have been detailing already in their run up to the local elections in terms of empower mayors, empower local authorities. The issue is where does the where's the council funding come from under the fiscal rules? But the policy of devolution is excellent. Yeah. Phil? So my top three would be uh, first of all, because you know, these are all policies that were going to lead to much better outcomes across the board. So the first one would be votes for 16 and 17 year olds because and, and I am I am disappointed that they've gone quiet on votes for EU citizens as well, um, because given that we allow citizens of Commonwealth countries who aren't mm -hmm. even settled here to vote in general elections, mm -hmm. I see absolutely no reason not to do that. But the, the bottom line is if you we have a first past the post system, but even in a first past the post system, if you shift uh, the balance of power, then you shift the um, 
Overton window naturally without even having to take time. So 16 and 17 year olds getting the vote is a big one for me. Uh, the second one is a, a broader way in which they're going to structure government. Like we're used, and we still have them now, we're used to this idea of government departments, government departments, and, and Labour are very clear, they don't work. So one of their biggest reforms is the problem with um, having that is then that Secretary of State is totally focused on the outcomes in there, but there are the links with other departments and you're then reliant on those Secretaries of State having a good relationship with the other Secretaries of State to come up. And, and, and Labour go, no, 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 this is madness. So you need people where there's going to be a project that's going to run across multiple departments to sort of take charge of that. So when you read their NHS paper, for example, it doesn't just talk about what they're going to do with the NHS. It talks about the need for good quality housing. It talks about the need for good jobs, yeah. good pay, things like that. So they're linking in how progress in, in like, that's completely outside of the Department for Health and Social Care is also going to help them drive their policies within the Department for Health and Social Care. Uh, so that is um, an important one for me as well. And in, in terms of a, a third one, it would be the first one they're going to go out of the gate with, which is, I don't know exactly what they call it, the Workers' Rights Bill. I think we know what that means. New Deal exactly for Working People. For the yeah, country. that's what, the, in terms of what the bill will be called. Um, that is huge. And going with it early is really important to make sure that people can feel the benefits come the next election, because it will take time to work through. And something like that, because what Labour need to be able to do ideally quite quickly, but but certainly by the next election is, is to just need to say to people, do you feel better off? You know, that has to be the transition in terms of the appeal in opposition to in government. Do you feel better off? Because the reason why, the where the Tories are getting it completely wrong, the reason they're waiting because they think the economy is going to improve. And they keep talking about two things, inflation, Inflation's already at 3.4% now. It's already close to target. There's not very much more for it to fall and people still feel worse off. And the reason for that is because they can remember what their standard of living was two years ago. They can't remember 15 years ago, but they can remember two years ago. And it's dropped so quickly that they noticed. And interest rates falling, I mean, the latest news is they'll fall a bit, maybe, but they're not going to fall as much as people think. And even if they did, how does that help people feel better off? It doesn't. It doesn't raise people's standard of living. So they're looking for things to happen over the next six months that don't make people feel any better off. Labour know they can't just point a graph. Oh, look, look, good economic news. That Vote for us again. That doesn't work. They need to say to people, do you not do what the Tories do? Oh, we made this town really brilliant. Oh, they're great. I mean, Victoria Atkins today, the health secretary, she was asked, she was she was trying to laud the fact that NHS waiting lists have come down a little tiny bit from their record level. Great. You say that there are ones doing well. Say them out loud. I think it, all I'm trying to do is to put into context that in an enormous system that treats 1.3 million people a day, that saw in the month of February 74,000 people going into A&E every single day, what I'm saying is that we know that there will be um, some people who have the sorts of experiences that are simply unacceptable, as you've already described, but there are also people who have had good experience. And, and she was trying, oh yeah, it's brilliant. And there's actually some NHS trust that are meeting, and it's even exceeding their target. She's trying to suggest there's some parts of the country where it's all marvellous. Um, and, and so she was asked, okay, can you name any of these NHS trusts then? What? Can, can you tell me which parts of the country are exceeding targets? No, I can't tell you that. So Labour can't fall back on, oh, we're making some parts of the country brilliant. It'll be your turn next, vote for us again, like the Tories do. They're going to have to go to voters and say, do you feel better? And they need those voters to say yes. Al Ronald Reagan. On that note, thank you very much, everyone. That was brilliant. You. If you want to see more of this, please click the like and subscribe button. Thanks, everyone. Thanks to our guests. Bye. Tune in next week for another exciting story from the files of Police Squad.